Hello everyone and welcome back to another Hufo. This is the series where I give you my honest, unfiltered opinions on a variety of subjects that you ask me on Instagram. Let's get to it. All right, to kick things off here, we have Lassa Solvik who asks my opinion on John Mayer saying that a line six can sound like a dumbbell. Okay, that's an interesting claim. Let's pull up the source video here. But the line six spider four is just like a dumbbell if you said it right. Could be, you could fool, you could fool anybody. You could fool me, you could fool anybody. I think it's pretty clear he's employing some sarcasm here. There's absolutely no way that John Mayer wouldn't hear the difference between a $125 Line 6 and a $125,000 Dumbbell. Even somebody with no ear for music or guitar gear is going to be able to tell the difference between an entry-level Line 6 amp and even a thousand dollar tube amp. However, I don't think that everyone's necessarily gonna prefer the Dumble. You could feed tons of people McDonald's hamburgers as well as a hamburger made from AAA dry aged beef, and there will be people who prefer the Mickey D's. I also think if you're playing in a band in a crowded bar, the difference between a super high-end amp and something that's not as expensive isn't gonna register much with a crowd who's probably half paying attention anyway. Whereas say you're in a world-class recording studio working on a guitar-centric album, yeah, that's where those kind of things do make a difference. My hot take is that John Mayer could go on tour and use his boutique two rock stuff as a decoy while running his guitar through a hot rod deluxe that's behind the scenes. And uh, if he did this, I think the vast majority of the audience if not everyone, would never notice. Moving on, Build Your Cages asks, my opinion on whether or not the Grammys are just a self-indulgent popularity contest. For me, the Grammys only register on my radar because I have friends who have friends who are involved in music that's up for Grammys and they shout them out on social media, so I see those posts. If it wasn't for that, I don't know when the last time was that I watched the Grammys. I'm not even sure if I've ever watched them, but I'll also say as much as I like to imagine myself as this cool guy who doesn't care about mainstream award shows and music isn't a contest man type of guy. If I were to ever get invited to the Grammys or if I were ever involved in music that won a Grammy, I'd probably be pretty hyped on it. I might even start telling people that the G in old Sammy G stands for Grammy. Well, Sammy Grammy kind of has a ring to it. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll try to win one next year. Now, before we move on, I want to quickly let you know that I have a newsletter. It comes out monthly-ish. It's free. And everybody who signs up for the newsletter in the next, I don't know, 24 hours, is going to get free access to my course, Pentatonic Mastery. In the newsletter, I do bite-sized lessons, tips, tricks, recommended listing, general musings, exclusive coupon codes, and that kind of stuff. It's just a way for us to be in touch in a different medium. It's completely free. I think it's pretty valuable, and it would be super cool if you signed up for it over at samuraiguitaristnewsletter.com. I'll also put up links for that in the description. And like I said, if you do so in the next 24 hours, then later this week, we'll be sending out an email that'll give you free access to my course, Pentatonic Mastery. Anyways, let's get back to it. Sebastian Simidian asks, should you put music on Spotify if you want it to be listened to as an unknown artist? I've been looking into this for a fair bit myself. Um, for a while now, I've been working on my first original album. It's gonna be released under a different moniker than Samurai Guitarist, and music-wise, I like to think that it's guitar-centric instrumental music for people who don't like <laughs> guitar-centric instrumental music. Um, and it's getting to the point where I'm pretty close to being able to put some stuff out into the world. So I've been trying to learn about the Spotify thing and one of the things I have learned is that, yes, you should absolutely put your music out on Spotify. There's a lot about the platform that I'm not necessarily a huge fan of, but if you wanna play the game, you gotta use the pieces that are in the box and Spotify is one of the key pieces right now. There are a number of services to get your music on Spotify that are easy to use, they're free to affordable, and the ability to trigger the Spotify algorithm in your favor and build an audience there is a potential that if you're not using it, you're only hurting yourself. Years ago, I used to upload some of the music from my YouTube videos on Spotify. I literally never advertised this, but if I go and look at how many streams some of those covers got, a number of them have tens and tens of thousands of views. It still brings in like $30 a month. So if I can do that from zero effort, I like to think that with a concerted effort, you could definitely use Spotify to your advantage. And from what I've learned, the best way to go about doing this is you upload your track onto Spotify for a future release date, tell 
everyone that you can to pre-save that track. And when the release date comes, there is a huge surge of traffic that goes towards it. This tells the Spotify algorithm to show your music to other people. And you can use this interest to pitch your track to playlists. And apparently some of these playlists can have a massive impact on getting your music heard by a lot of different people. Again, I'm in the learning stages here. If you have some information about Spotify that you think might be valuable for others, feel free to drop it down in the comment section. And uh, yeah, keep your ears open. In the not too distant future, an old Sammy G original album will be coming to Spotify. In a somewhat similar vein, what's my hoofo on TikTok and its ability to grant 15 seconds of fame? I have a lot of thoughts about not just TikTok, but short form content in general, both as a guy who consumes it as well as someone who creates a fair bit of it. As a creator, I enjoy it in certain doses. The time limitation and the frame size gets me thinking much differently than I do about a long form video like this one. And it's always nice to do something different now and then. It's gratifying because it doesn't take long to produce and the ability to reach a much larger audience with it seems much more likely. I mean, my most viewed short form video has like six times as many views as my most viewed long form video. You can also repurpose older content, stuff that someone might have missed or forgot about. Short form video isn't going anywhere, it's here to stay. My problem with it is, well, first of all, it makes next to no money and it's much harder to transition a short form viewer into somebody who's actually invested in your content. I mean, my TikTok has like 90,000 followers and I find myself wondering what if any value has it brought to my business. I also think that things like TikTok have a much deeper psychological impact on the way that we consume other content. Going on TikTok, you're seeking out instant gratification. If a video doesn't immediately trigger the pleasure centers of your brain, swipe, you're on to the next one, keep it going indefinitely. And I found whenever I go down one of these holes, an hour can disappear just like that. And I leave my phone in a bit of a daze. And I don't know about you, but if I spend a lot of time with this kind of thing, I never feel good. My brain feels slower and dumber. And I honestly think that I have a harder time focusing on things for longer periods of time ever since I started consuming this type of content. Like now a two hour movie seems daunting, even though I've always loved movies. So I've made an effort to regulate how much TikTok or YouTube shorts content that I'll consume. And I feel like my life is just better when I consume this kind of thing in small doses, which is kind of the opposite of what these apps are trying to get you to do. But I'm kind of veering off topic here. The original question was, what do I think about the ability for TikTok to create 15 seconds of fame? For the right, mentally stable, healthy person, 15 seconds of TikTok fame could be an interesting side note in a well-rounded life. But for a lot of people, I think, Getting that 15 seconds and then always chasing that rush can be a fairly negative thing. I say this as a professional content creator. I'm 35 years old, I'm eight years into this, and there are some things that I really struggle with. There are some amazing things, but there's also a dark side of this that you're always kind of towing and it's not put on display nearly as much as the cool stuff. If I was like 15 or 16 and had some form of internet fame, Man, I, I just can't see how that would have been a positive thing in the long run for me. All right, next up, this fellow wants to know if I pity my fellow YouTuber, Sean Daniel, for having lost his complete entourage. Sean is one of my favorite and closest YouTube friends. I fully support his life decisions, and I'll be honest, I actually pity his entourage for losing him. Jokes aside, <laughs> I'm not really sure what this is referencing, but uh, I added it here because it's always nice to plug my man Sean's YouTube channel. He does great guitar-based stuff, and I think you should probably check it out. Fuego6016 asks if there's a music genre that I used to be really into that I now don't like. There are two things that I can think of that come to mind here. Um, first of all, it would be shreddy guitar stuff. I definitely went through a phase where I was listening to Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, Buckethead, that kind of thing. And while I have just the ultimate respect for those musicians, it's just, it's just not my thing anymore. It would be a very specific scenario where I would want to listen to that music. Besides that, 
mainstream country music is a genre I spent a lot of time in. Uh, long story short, at the end of my college days, I realized I had a real knack for writing Americana music, Steve Earle, Tom Petty, that kind of thing is just like some of my favorite music in the world. But there was no way that I could see myself creating a career writing this kind of music. I figured that the closest place that I could take my skill sets and put them to use was mainstream country music where there was still money to be made. So I started listening to this music as much as I possibly could, you know, market research. Uh, I ended up going down to Nashville a fair bit, doing songwriting workshops, writing with anybody who I possibly could. Not a whole lot came of it. There were a few tracks recorded that I wrote on some minor unknown artists albums and there were a few cool things that I wrote and released in one place or another uh, which I'll link to in the description. But I immersed myself in mainstream country music even though at first I disliked a lot of it but this is where I saw opportunity and the more that I listened to it the more I was able to find elements of the music that I genuinely enjoyed and there are artists and songs that I still think are really amazing it's just unfortunate that they get drowned out by a lot of the hot trash there. If I really needed to I could probably re-immerse myself in that music and redevelop my love-hate relationship though currently where I spend zero percent of my time listening to pop country it is a uh, a hate-hate relationship. And it's too bad because when country music was made for farmers, it was great, but then they started making it for frat boys. Next up, we have DJ Musi who asks, does skill level really matter if you're just in it for the fun and creativity of it? I certainly believe so. It's like, <laughs> Imagine you're hammering crooked nails into a stump. That might be fun for a little bit of time, but before long, you're gonna feel fairly limited and you're gonna get bored. Whereas if you develop a wealth of skills and tools, you're gonna have a whole lot more fun building stuff than a old hammer stump you. And I'd like to point out that skill and virtuosoism isn't necessarily the same thing. Take a guy like, uh, like Tom DeLonge from Blink-182. There is a lot that he can do from his fairly limited toolbox, but he can pull a lot of really great things out of that, um, which is a skill in its own right. I don't know, I have a hard time imagining a truly skillless guitar player who's gonna have any real fun for any extended period of time. And let's do one more here. Doorknob asks my honest unfiltered opinion on ghostwriters in music. Ghostwriting is when somebody else writes a part of your song without being given credit for it. Why would you do this? Well, if part of your persona is deeply tied into your lyrics and maybe it takes away some of the authenticity if somebody else wrote them so you keep it a secret. The genre I've heard that this happens the most in is hip-hop and maybe the most famous example of this is the song Still Dre where uh, Snoop and Dr. Dre's lyrics were written entirely by Jay-Z. Here's a uh, Snoop Dogg talking about that. He wrote Dre shit and my shit and it was flawless and me and DOC was like well Looks like this nigga outstruck us on this one. So we're going to take the back seat and I'm going to accept it. And it was still Dre and it was Jay-Z and he wrote the whole fucking song. And I mean, I love that attitude. It ties into my one rule of music, which is you always and only serve the higher being, which is the song. Everything you do, no matter what, should make the song better, even if that means you have to take a step back. And it's kind of implied in hip hop that the guys rapping the lyrics are the guys who are also writing, but if I pull up the credits for this song in this album, I can see that it says publishing S. Carter, Sean Carter, AKA Jay-Z. However, it's not like it says lyrics written by Jay-Z and this was not necessarily a publicized fact. I actually met a writer once and she did ghost writing for some fairly well-known hip hop artists. And I think this is just, something that happens a fair bit more than the general public knows. It's kind of like the unspoken secret of the genre. My opinion, in a perfect world, the writers would just be given their due credit. Uh, and if you didn't write the song, but you still performed it, no big deal. It doesn't really change my experience with it. In practicality though, if there are certain expectations on the genre and the only way that you're gonna get some of these great pieces of art is through uncredited ghostwriting, it's a bit unfortunate, but Whatever, if everybody is consenting to this arrangement, so be it. I will say though, I would be a bit disappointed if it was like straight up lied about. Say someone like Eminem, who has been vocal about writing all of his own lyrics and pretty anti-ghostwriter. If it turned out Eminem was in fact using a ghostwriter, 
yeah, I think that'd be fairly disappointing. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Another Hufo in the books. I hope you enjoyed this video. And remember, you can sign up for the old Sammy G monthly-ish newsletter over at www.samurayguitaristnewsletter.com. I'll put a link up for that in the description as well. It's just another way that we can be in contact and I can share with you guys some stuff that doesn't make sense on the YouTube channel. So. I'd love it if you signed up. Thank you all for watching, and the biggest of thank yous to everyone who supports my channel through Patreon. If you want to check out some of that Sammy G merch, you can do so at shopsamuraiguitarist.com. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell, and stay tuned for a wide range of music-related content. Until next time, look after yourselves, look after each other, look after the planet. I'm Samurai Guitarist, and I'll see you again soon.